India, officially the Republic of India, is a country in South Asia. It is the seventh largest country by area, the second most populous country, and the most populous democracy in the world. Bounded by the Indian Ocean on the south, the Arabian Sea on the southwest, and the Bay of Bengal on the southeast, it shares land borders with Pakistan to the west, China, Nepal, and Bhutan to the north, and Bangladesh and Myanmar to the east. In the Indian Ocean, India is in the vicinity of Sri Lanka and the Maldives, its Andaman and Nicobar Islands share a maritime border with Thailand, Myanmar, and Indonesia. Modern humans arrived on the Indian subcontinent from Africa no later than 55,000 years ago. Their long occupation, initially in varying forms of isolation as hunter-gatherers, has made the region highly diverse, second only to Africa in human genetic diversity. Settled life emerged on the subcontinent in the western margins of the Indus River Basin 9,000 years ago, evolving gradually into the Indus Valley civilization of the 3rd millennium BCE. By 1200 BCE, an archaic form of Sanskrit, an Indo-European language, had diffused into India from the northwest, unfolding as the language of the Rigveda, and recording the dawning of Hinduism in India. The Dravidian languages of India, were supplanted in the northern and western regions. By 400 BCE, stratification and exclusion by caste had emerged within Hinduism, and Buddhism and Jainism had arisen, proclaiming social orders unlinked to heredity. Early political consolidations gave rise to the loose-knit Maurya, and Gupta empires based in the Ganges Basin. Their collective era was suffused with wide-ranging creativity, but also marked by the declining status of women, and the incorporation of untouchability into an organized system of belief. In South India, the Middle Kingdoms exported Dravidian languages scripts and religious cultures to the kingdoms of Southeast Asia. In the early medieval era, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, and Zoroastrianism put down roots on India's southern and western coasts. Muslim armies from Central Asia intermittently overran India's northern plains. Eventually establishing the Delhi Sultanate, and drawing northern India into the cosmopolitan networks of medieval Islam. In the 15th century, the Vijayanagara Empire created a long-lasting composite Hindu culture in South India. In the Punjab, Sikhism emerged, rejecting institutionalized religion. The Mughal Empire, in 1526, ushered in two centuries of relative peace, leaving a legacy of luminous architecture. Gradually expanding rule of the British East India Company followed, turning India into a colonial economy, but also consolidating its sovereignty. British Crown rule began in 1858. The rights promised to Indians were granted slowly, but technological changes were introduced, and ideas of education, modernity and the public life took root. A pioneering and influential nationalist movement emerged, which was noted for non-violent resistance and became the major factor in ending British rule. In 1947 the British Indian Empire was partitioned into two independent dominions, a Hindu-majority dominion of India, and a Muslim-majority dominion of Pakistan, amid large-scale loss of life, and an unprecedented migration. India has been a federal republic since 1950, governed in a democratic parliamentary system. It is a pluralistic, multilingual, and multi ethnic society. India's population grew from 361 million in 1951 to 1.211 billion in 2011. During the same time, its nominal per capita income increased from 64 US dollars annually to 1498 US dollars and its literacy rate from 16.6% to 74% from being a comparatively destitute country in 1951 India has become a fast growing major economy and a hub for information technology services with an expanding middle class it has a space program which includes several planned or completed extraterrestrial missions. Indian movies, music, and spiritual teachings play an increasing role in global culture. India has substantially reduced its rate of poverty, though at the cost of increasing economic inequality. 
India is a nuclear weapon state, which ranks high in military expenditure. It has disputes over Kashmir with its neighbors, Pakistan and China, unresolved, since the mid-20th century. Among the socio-economic challenges India faces are gender inequality, child malnutrition, and rising levels of air pollution. India's land is megadiverse, with four biodiversity hotspots. Its forest cover comprises 21.7% of its area. India's wildlife, which has traditionally been viewed with tolerance in India's culture, is supported among these forests, and elsewhere, in protected habitats. Chapter 1 – Etymology According to the Oxford English Dictionary, the name India is derived from the classical Latin India, a reference to South Asia and an uncertain region to its east, and in turn derived successively from, Hellenistic Greek India, Ancient Greek Indos, Old Persian Hindush, an eastern province of the Achaemenid Empire, and ultimately its cognate, the Sanskrit Sindhu, or river, specifically the Indus River and, by implication, its well-settled southern basin. The ancient Greeks referred to the Indians as Indwa, which translates as the people of the Indus. The term Bharat, mentioned in both Indian epic poetry and the constitution of India, is used in its variations by many Indian languages. A modern rendering of the historical name Bharata Varsha, which applied originally to North India, Bharat gained increased currency from the mid-19th century as a native name for India. Hindustan is a Middle Persian name for India, introduced during the Mughal Empire and used widely since. Its meaning has varied, referring to a region encompassing present-day northern India, and Pakistan or to India in its near entirety. Chapter 2 – History Chapter 2 Section 1 – Ancient India by 55,000 years ago, the first modern humans, or Homo sapiens, had arrived on the Indian subcontinent from Africa, where they had earlier evolved. The earliest known modern human remains in South Asia date to about 30,000 years ago. After 6500 BC, evidence for domestication of food crops and animals, construction of permanent structures, and storage of agricultural surplus appeared in Meghra and other sites in what is now Balochistan, Pakistan. These gradually developed into the Indus Valley Civilization, the first urban culture in South Asia, which flourished during 2500 to 1900 BCE in what is now Pakistan and Western India. Centered around cities such as Mohenjo Daro, Harappa, Dolavira, and Kalibangan, and relying on varied forms of subsistence, the civilization engaged robustly in crafts production and wide-ranging trade. During the period 2000 to 500 BCE, many regions of the subcontinent transitioned from the Chalcolithic cultures to the Iron Age ones. The Vedas, the oldest scriptures associated with Hinduism, were composed during this period, and historians have analyzed these to posit a Vedic culture in the Punjab region and the Upper Gangetic Plain. Most historians also consider this period to have encompassed several waves of Indo-Aryan migration into the subcontinent from the northwest. The caste system, which created a hierarchy of priests, warriors, and free peasants, but which excluded indigenous peoples by labeling their occupations impure, arose during this period. On the Deccan Plateau, Archaeological evidence from this period suggests the existence of a chiefdom stage of political organization. In South India, a progression to sedentary life is indicated by the large number of megalithic monuments dating from this period, as well as by nearby traces of agriculture, irrigation tanks, and craft traditions. In the late Vedic period, around the 6th century BCE, the small states and chiefdoms of the Ganges Plain and the northwestern regions have consolidated into 16 major oligarchies and monarchies that were known as the Mahajanapadas. The emerging urbanization gave rise to non-Vedic religious movements, two of which became independent religions. Jainism came into prominence during the life of its exemplar, Mahavara. Buddhism, based on the teachings of Gautama Buddha, attracted followers from all social classes excepting the middle class, chronicling the life of the Buddha was central to the beginnings of recorded history in India. In an age of increasing urban wealth, 
both religions held up renunciation as an ideal, and both established long-lasting monastic traditions. Politically, by the 3rd century BCE, the Kingdom of Magadha had annexed or reduced other states to emerge as the Mauryan Empire. The empire was once thought to have controlled most of the subcontinent except the far south, but its core regions are now thought to have been separated by large autonomous areas. The Mauryan kings are known as much for their empire building and determined management of public life as for Ashoka's renunciation of militarism, and far flung advocacy of the Buddhist Dhamma. The Sangam literature of the Tamil language reveals that, between 200 BC and 200 CE, the southern peninsula was ruled by the Cheras, the Cholas, and the Pandyas, dynasties that traded extensively with the Roman Empire and with West and Southeast Asia. In North India, Hinduism asserted patriarchal control within the family, leading to increased subordination of women. By the 4th and 5th centuries, the Gupta Empire had created a complex system of administration and taxation in the Greater Ganges Plain, this system became a model for later Indian kingdoms. Under the Guptas, a renewed Hinduism based on devotion, rather than the management of ritual, began to assert itself. This renewal was reflected in a flowering of sculpture and architecture, which found patrons among an urban elite. Classical Sanskrit literature flowered as well, and Indian science, astronomy, medicine, and mathematics made significant advances. Chapter 2 Section 2 Medieval India The Indian Early Medieval Age, from 600 to 1200 CE, is defined by regional kingdoms and cultural diversity. When Harsha of Kanauj, who ruled much of the Indo-Gangetic plain from 606 to 647 CE, attempted to expand southwards, he was defeated by the Shalukya ruler of the Deccan. When his successor attempted to expand eastwards, he was defeated by the Pala king of Bengal. When the Shalukyas attempted to expand southwards, they were defeated by the Pallavas from farther south, who in turn were opposed by the Pandyas and the Cholas from still farther south. No ruler of this period was able to create an empire and consistently control lands much beyond their core region. During this time, pastoral peoples, whose land had been cleared to make way for the growing agricultural economy, were accommodated within caste society, as were new non-traditional ruling classes. The caste system consequently began to show regional differences. In the 6th and 7th centuries, the first devotional hymns were created in the Tamil language. They were imitated all over India and led to both the resurgence of Hinduism and the development of all modern languages of the subcontinent. Indian royalty, big and small, and the temples they patronized drew citizens in great numbers to the capital cities, which became economic hubs as well. Temple towns of various sizes began to appear everywhere as India underwent another urbanization. By the 8th and 9th centuries, the effects were felt in Southeast Asia, as South Indian culture and political systems were exported to lands that became part of modern-day Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, Philippines, Malaysia, and Java. Indian merchants, scholars, and sometimes armies were involved in this transmission, Southeast Asians took the initiative as well, with many sojourning in Indian seminaries and translating Buddhist and Hindu texts into their languages. After the 10th century, Muslim Central Asian nomadic clans, using swift horse cavalry and raising vast armies united by ethnicity and religion, repeatedly overran South Asia's northwestern plains, leading eventually to the establishment of the Islamic Delhi Sultanate in 1206. The Sultanate was to control much of North India, and to make many forays into South India. Although at first, disruptive for the Indian elites, the Sultanate largely left its vast non-Muslim subject population to its own laws and customs. By repeatedly repulsing Mongol raiders in the 13th century, the Sultanate saved India from the devastation visited on West and Central Asia, setting the scene for centuries of migration of fleeing soldiers, learned men, mystics, traders, artists, and artisans from that region into the subcontinent, thereby creating a syncretic Indo-Islamic culture in the north. 
The Sultanate's raiding and weakening of the regional kingdoms of South India paved the way for the indigenous Vijayanagara Empire. Embracing a strong Shaivite tradition and building upon the military technology of the Sultanate, the empire came to control much of peninsular India, and was to influence South Indian society for long afterwards. Chapter 2 Section 3 Early Modern India In the early 16th century, northern India, then under mainly Muslim rulers, fell again to the superior mobility and firepower of a new generation of Central Asian warriors. The resulting Mughal Empire, did not stamp out the local societies it came to rule. Instead, it balanced and pacified them through new administrative practices and diverse and inclusive ruling elites, leading to more systematic, centralized, and uniform rule. Eschewing tribal bonds and Islamic identity, especially under Akbar, the Mughals united their far-flung realms through loyalty, expressed through a Persianized culture, to an emperor who had near-divine status. The Mughal state's economic policies, deriving most revenues from agriculture and mandating that taxes be paid in the well-regulated silver currency, caused peasants and artisans to enter larger markets. The relative peace maintained by the empire during much of the 17th century was a factor in India's economic expansion, resulting in greater patronage of painting, literary forms, textiles, and architecture. Newly coherent social groups in northern and western India, such as the Mirattas, the Rajputs, and the Sikhs, gained military and governing ambitions during Mughal rule, which, through collaboration or adversity, gave them both recognition and military experience. Expanding commerce during Mughal rule gave rise to new Indian commercial and political elites along the coasts of southern and eastern India. As the empire disintegrated, many among these elites were able to seek and control their own affairs. By the early 18th century, with the lines between commercial and political dominance being increasingly blurred, a number of European trading companies, including the English East India Company, had established coastal outposts. The East India Company's control of the seas, greater resources, and more advanced military training and technology led it to increasingly assert its military strength and caused it to become attractive to a portion of the Indian elite. These factors were crucial in allowing the company to gain control over the Bengal region by 1765 and sideline the other European companies. Its further access to the riches of Bengal and the subsequent increased strength and size of its army enabled it to annex or subdue most of India by the 1820s. India was then no longer exporting manufactured goods as it long had, but was instead supplying the British Empire with raw materials. Many historians consider this to be the onset of India's colonial period. By this time, with its economic power severely curtailed by the British Parliament and having effectively been made an arm of British administration, the company began more consciously to enter non-economic arenas like education, social reform, and culture. Chapter 2 Section 4 Modern India Historians consider India's modern age to have begun sometime between 1848 and 1885. The appointment in 1848 of Lord Dalhousie as Governor-General of the East India Company set the stage for changes essential to a modern state. These included the consolidation and demarcation of sovereignty, the surveillance of the population, and the education of citizens. Technological changes, among them, railways, canals, and the telegraph, were introduced not long after their introduction in Europe. However, disaffection with the company also grew during this time and set off the Indian Rebellion of 1857. Fed by diverse resentments and perceptions, including invasive British-style social reforms, harsh land taxes, and summary treatment of some rich landowners and princes, the rebellion rocked many regions of northern and central India, and shook the foundations of company rule. Although the rebellion was suppressed by 1858, it led to the dissolution of the East India Company and the direct administration of India by the British government. Proclaiming a unitary state and a gradual but limited British-style parliamentary system, the new rulers also protected princes and landed gentry as a feudal safeguard against future unrest. In the decades following, public life gradually emerged all over India, 
leading eventually to the founding of the Indian National Congress in 1885. The rush of technology and the commercialization of agriculture in the second half of the 19th century was marked by economic setbacks, and many small farmers became dependent on the whims of faraway markets. There was an increase in the number of large scale famines, and, despite the risks of infrastructure development borne by Indian taxpayers, little industrial employment was generated for Indians. There were also salutary effects, commercial cropping, especially in the newly canneled Punjab, led to increased food production for internal consumption. The railway network provided critical famine relief, notably reduced the cost of moving goods, and helped nascent Indian-owned industry. After World War I, in which approximately one million Indians served, a new period began. It was marked by British reforms but also repressive legislation, by more strident Indian calls for self-rule, and by the beginnings of a non-violent movement of non-cooperation, of which Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi would become the leader and enduring symbol. During the 1930s, slow legislative reform was enacted by the British, the Indian National Congress won victories in the resulting elections. The next decade was beset with crises, Indian participation in World War II, the Congress's final push for non-cooperation, and an upsurge of Muslim nationalism. All were capped by the advent of independence in 1947, but tempered by the partition of India into two states, India and Pakistan. Vital to India's self-image as an independent nation was its constitution, completed in 1950, which put in place a secular and democratic republic. It has remained a democracy with civil liberties, an active Supreme Court, and a largely independent press. Economic liberalization, which began in the 1990s, has created a large urban middle class, transformed India into one of the world's fastest growing economies, and increased its geopolitical clout. Indian movies, music, and spiritual teachings play an increasing role in global culture. Yet, India is also shaped by seemingly unyielding poverty, both rural and urban, by religious and caste-related violence, by Maoist-inspired Naxalite insurgencies, and by separatism in Jammu and Kashmir and in northeast India. It has unresolved territorial disputes with China and with Pakistan. India's sustained democratic freedoms are unique among the world's newer nations, however, in spite of its recent economic successes, freedom from want for its disadvantaged population remains a goal yet to be achieved. Chapter 3 – Geography India accounts for the bulk of the Indian subcontinent, lying atop the Indian tectonic plate, a part of the Indo-Australian plate. India's defining geological processes began 75 million years ago when the Indian plate, then part of the southern supercontinent Gondwana, began the northeastward drift caused by seafloor spreading to its southwest, and later, south and southeast. Simultaneously, the vast, Tethian oceanic crust, to its northeast, began to subduct under the Eurasian plate. These dual processes, driven by convection in the Earth's mantle, both created the Indian Ocean and caused the Indian continental crust eventually to underthrust Eurasia, and to uplift the Himalayas. Immediately south of the emerging Himalayas, plate movement created a vast trough that rapidly filled with river-borne sediment, and now constitutes the Indo-Gangetic Plain. Cut off from the plain by the ancient Aravalli Range lies the Tar Desert. The original Indian plate survives as Peninsula India, the oldest and geologically most stable part of India. It extends as far north as the Satpura and Vindhya ranges in central India. These parallel chains run from the Arabian Sea coast in Gujarat in the west to the coal-rich Chotanagpur plateau in Jharkhand in the east. To the south, the remaining peninsula landmass, the Deccan plateau, is flanked on the west and east by coastal ranges known as the Western and Eastern Ghats. The plateau contains the country's oldest rock formations, some over one billion years old. Constituted in such fashion, India lies to the north of the equator between 6 degrees 44 and 35 degrees 30 north latitude and 68 degrees 7, and 97 degrees 25 east longitude. India's coastline measures 7,517 kilometers in length, of this distance, 
5,423 km belong to Peninsula India, and 2,094 km to the Andaman, Nicobar, and Lakshadweep island chains. According to the Indian Naval Hydrographic Charts, the mainland coastline consists of the following, 43% sandy beaches, 11% rocky shores, including cliffs, and 46% mudflats or marshy shores. Major Himalayan origin rivers that substantially flow through India include the Ganges and the Brahmaputra, both of which drain into the Bay of Bengal. Important tributaries of the Ganges include the Yamuna and the Kosi, the latter's extremely low gradient, caused by long term silt deposition, leads to severe floods and course changes. Major peninsular rivers, whose steeper gradients prevent their waters from flooding, include the Godavari, the Mahanadi, the Kaveri, and the Krishna, which also drain into the Bay of Bengal, and the Narmada and the Taptai, which drain into the Arabian Sea. Coastal features include the marshy Ran of Kutch of western India, and the alluvial Sundarbans Delta of eastern India, the latter is shared with Bangladesh. India has two archipelagos, the Lakshadweep, coral atolls off India's southwestern coast, and the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, a volcanic chain in the Andaman Sea. Indian climate is strongly influenced by the Himalayas and the Tar Desert, both of which drive the economically and culturally pivotal summer and winter monsoons. The Himalayas prevent cold Central Asian catabatic winds from blowing in, keeping the bulk of the Indian subcontinent warmer than most locations at similar latitudes. The Tar Desert plays a crucial role in attracting the moisture-laden southwest summer monsoon winds that, between June and October, provide the majority of India's rainfall. Four major climatic groupings predominate in India, tropical wet, tropical dry, subtropical humid, and montane. Temperatures in India have risen by 0.7 degrees Celsius between 1901 and 2018. Climate change in India is often thought to be the cause. The retreat of Himalayan glaciers has adversely affected the flow rate of the major Himalayan rivers, including the Ganges and the Brahmaputra. According to some current projections, the number and severity of droughts in India will have markedly increased by the end of the present century. Chapter 4 Biodiversity India is a megadiverse country a term employed for 17 countries which display high biological diversity and contain many species exclusively indigenous, or endemic, to them. India is a habitat for 8.6% of all mammal species, 13.7% of bird species, 7.9% of reptile species, 6% of amphibian species, 12.2% of fish species, and 6.0% of all flowering plant species. Fully a third of Indian plant species are endemic. India also contains four of the world's 34 biodiversity hotspots, or regions that display significant habitat loss in the presence of high endemism. According to official statistics, India's forest cover is 713,789 square kilometers, which is 21.71% of the country's total land area. It can be subdivided further into broad categories of canopy density, or the proportion of the area of a forest covered by its tree canopy. Very dense forest, whose canopy density is greater than 70%, occupies 3.02% of India's land area. It predominates in the tropical moist forest of the Andaman Islands, the Western Ghats, and Northeast India. Moderately dense forest, whose canopy density is between 40% and 70%, occupies 9.39% of India's land area. It predominates in the temperate coniferous forest of the Himalayas, the moist deciduous sal forest of eastern India, and the dry deciduous teak forest of central and southern India. Open forest, whose canopy density is between 10% and 40%, occupies 9.26% of India's land area, and predominates in the Babul-dominated thorn forest of the central Deccan Plateau and the western Gangetic Plain. Among the Indian subcontinent's notable indigenous trees are the astringent Azadaracta indica, or neem, which is widely used in rural Indian herbal medicine, and the luxuriant Ficus religiosa, or people, which is displayed on the ancient seals of Mohenjo-daro, and under which the Buddha is recorded in the Pali Canon to have sought enlightenment. 
Many Indian species have descended from those of Gondwana, the southern supercontinent from which India separated more than 100 million years ago. India's subsequent collision with Eurasia set off a mass exchange of species. However, volcanism and climatic changes later caused the extinction of many endemic Indian forms. Still later, mammals entered India from Asia through two zoogeographical passes flanking the Himalayas. This had the effect of lowering endemism among India's mammals, which stands at 12.6%, contrasting with 45.8% among reptiles and 55.8% among amphibians. Notable endemics are the vulnerable hooded leaf monkey and the threatened beddams toad of the Western Ghats. India contains 172 Yukon designated threatened animal species, or 2.9% of endangered forms. These include the endangered Bengal tiger, and the Ganges River dolphin. Critically endangered species include, the gurial, a crocodilian, the great Indian bustard, and the Indian white-rumped vulture, which has become nearly extinct by having ingested the carrion of diclofenac-treated cattle. The pervasive and ecologically devastating human encroachment of recent decades has critically endangered Indian wildlife. In response, the system of national parks and protected areas, first established in 1935, was expanded substantially. In 1972, India enacted the Wildlife Protection Act and Project Tiger to safeguard crucial wilderness, the Forest Conservation Act was enacted in 1980 and amendments added in 1988. India hosts more than 500 wildlife sanctuaries and 13 biosphere reserves, four of which are part of the World Network of Biosphere Reserves, 25 wetlands are registered under the Ramsar Convention. Chapter 5, Politics and Government Chapter 5 Section 1, Government India is a federation with a parliamentary system governed under the Constitution of India, the country's supreme legal document. It is a constitutional republic and representative democracy, in which majority rule is tempered by minority rights protected by law. Federalism in India defines the power distribution between the Union and the states. The Constitution of India, which came into effect on 26 January 1950, originally stated India to be a sovereign, democratic republic, this characterization was amended in 1971 to a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic. India's form of government, traditionally described as quasi-federal with a strong center and weak states, has grown increasingly federal since the late 1990s as a result of political, economic, and social changes. The government of India comprises three branches. Executive, the President of India, is the ceremonial head of state, who is elected indirectly for a five-year term by an electoral college comprising members of national and state legislatures. The Prime Minister of India, is the head of government and exercises most executive power. Appointed by the President, the Prime Minister is by convention supported by the party or political alliance having a majority of seats in the lower house of parliament. The executive of the Indian government consists of the President, the Vice President, and the Union Council of Ministers, with the Cabinet being its executive committee, headed by the Prime Minister. Any minister holding a portfolio must be a member of one of the houses of parliament. In the Indian parliamentary system, the executive is subordinate to the legislature, the prime minister and their council are directly responsible to the lower house of the parliament. Civil servants act as permanent executives and all decisions of the executive are implemented by them. Legislature, the legislature of India, is the bicameral parliament. Operating under a Westminster-style parliamentary system, it comprises an upper house called the Rajya Sabha, and a lower house called the Lok Sabha. The Rajya Sabha is a permanent body of 245 members who serve staggered six-year terms. Most are elected indirectly by the state and union territorial legislatures in numbers proportional to their state's share of the national population. All but two of the Lok Sabha's 545 members are elected directly by popular vote, they represent single-member constituencies for five-year terms. Two seats of parliament, reserved for Anglo-Indian, in the Article 331, 
have been scrapped. Judiciary India has a three tier unitary independent judiciary comprising the Supreme Court, headed by the Chief Justice of India, 25 high courts, and a large number of trial courts. The Supreme Court has original jurisdiction over cases involving fundamental rights and over disputes between states and the center and has appellate jurisdiction over the high courts. It has the power to both strike down union or state laws which contravene the Constitution, and invalidate any government action it deems unconstitutional. Chapter 5 Section 2 Administrative Divisions India is a federal union comprising 28 states and 8 union territories. All states, as well as the union territories of Jammu and Kashmir, Puducherry and the National Capital Territory of Delhi, have elected legislatures and governments following the Westminster system of governance. The remaining five union territories are directly ruled by the central government through appointed administrators. In 1956, under the States Reorganization Act, states were reorganized on a linguistic basis. There are over a quarter of a million local government bodies at city, town, block, district and village levels. Chapter 6 Foreign, Economic and Strategic Relations In the 1950s, India strongly supported decolonization in Africa and Asia and played a leading role in the non-aligned movement. After initially cordial relations with neighboring China, India went to war with China in 1962, and was widely thought to have been humiliated. India has had tense relations with neighboring Pakistan, the two nations have gone to war four times, in 1947, 1965, 1971, and 1999. Three of these wars were fought over the disputed territory of Kashmir, while the fourth, the 1971 war, followed from India's support for the independence of Bangladesh. In the late 1980s, the Indian military twice intervened abroad at the invitation of the host country, a peacekeeping operation in Sri Lanka between 1987 and 1990, and an armed intervention to prevent a 1988 coup d'état attempt in the Maldives. After the 1965 war with Pakistan, India began to pursue close military and economic ties with the Soviet Union, by the late 1960s, the Soviet Union was its largest arms supplier. Aside from ongoing its special relationship with Russia, India has wide ranging defense relations with Israel and France. In recent years, it has played key roles in the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation and the World Trade Organization. The nation has provided 100,000 military and police personnel to serve in 35 UN peacekeeping operations across four continents. It participates in the East Asia Summit, the G8 plus 5, and other multilateral forums. India has close economic ties with countries in South America, Asia, and Africa, it pursues a look east policy that seeks to strengthen partnerships with the ASEAN nations, Japan, and South Korea that revolve around many issues, but especially those involving economic investment and regional security. China's nuclear test of 1964, as well as its repeated threats to intervene in support of Pakistan in the 1965 war, convinced India to develop nuclear weapons. India conducted its first nuclear weapons test in 1974 and carried out additional underground testing in 1998. Despite criticism and military sanctions, India has signed neither the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty nor the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, considering both to be flawed and discriminatory. India maintains a no-first-use nuclear policy and is developing a nuclear triad capability as a part of its minimum credible deterrence doctrine. It is developing a ballistic missile defense shield and a fifth-generation fighter jet. Other indigenous military projects involve the design and implementation of Vikrant class aircraft carriers and Ihant class nuclear submarines. Since the end of the Cold War, India has increased its economic, strategic, and military cooperation with the United States and the European Union. In 2008, a civilian nuclear agreement was signed between India and the United States. Although India possessed nuclear weapons at the time and was not a party to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, it received waivers from the International Atomic Energy Agency, 
and the Nuclear Suppliers Group, ending earlier restrictions on India's nuclear technology and commerce. As a consequence, India became the sixth de facto nuclear weapons state. India subsequently signed cooperation agreements involving civilian nuclear energy with Russia, France, the United Kingdom, and Canada. The President of India is the supreme commander of the nation's armed forces, with 1.45 million active troops, they compose the world's second largest military. It comprises the Indian Army, the Indian Navy, the Indian Air Force, and the Indian Coast Guard. The official Indian defense budget for 2011 was 36.03 billion US dollars, or 1.83% of GDP. Defense expenditure was pegged at 70.12 billion US dollars for fiscal year 2022-23 and increased 9.8% than previous fiscal year. India is the world's second largest arms importer between 2016 and 2020. It accounted for 9.5% of the total global arms imports. Much of the military expenditure was focused on defense against Pakistan and countering growing Chinese influence in the Indian Ocean. In May 2017, the Indian Space Research Organization launched the South Asia Satellite, a gift from India to its neighboring ZARC countries. In October 2018, India signed a 5.43 billion US dollars agreement with Russia to procure four S-400 Triumph surface-to-air missile defense systems, Russia's most advanced long-range missile defense system. Chapter 7, Economy According to the International Monetary Fund, the Indian economy in 2020 was nominally worth $2.7 trillion, it is the sixth largest economy by market exchange rates, and is around $8.9 trillion, the third largest by purchasing power parity. With its average annual GDP growth rate of 5.8% over the past two decades, and reaching 6.1% during 2011-2012, India is one of the world's fastest-growing economies. However, the country ranks 139th in the world in nominal GDP per capita and 118th in GDP per capita at PPP. Until 1991, all Indian governments followed protectionist policies that were influenced by socialist economics. Widespread state intervention and regulation largely walled the economy off from the outside world. An acute balance of payments crisis in 1991 forced the nation to liberalize its economy, since then it has moved slowly towards a free market system by emphasizing both foreign trade and direct investment inflows. India has been a member of WTO since 1 January 1995. The 522 million worker Indian labor force is the world's second largest, as of 2017. The service sector makes up 55.6% of GDP, the industrial sector 26.3%, and the agricultural sector 18.1%. India's foreign exchange remittances of 87 billion US dollars in 2021, highest in the world, were contributed to its economy by 32 million Indians working in foreign countries. Major agricultural products include rice, wheat, oilseed, cotton, jute, tea, sugarcane, and potatoes. Major industries include textiles, telecommunications, chemicals, pharmaceuticals biotechnology, food processing, steel, transport equipment, cement, mining, petroleum, machinery, and software. In 2006, the share of external trade in India's GDP stood at 24%, up from 6% in 1985. In 2008, India's share of world trade was 1.68%, in 2011, India was the world's 10th largest importer and the 19th largest exporter. Major exports include, petroleum products, textile goods, jewellery, software, engineering goods, chemicals, and manufactured leather goods. Major imports include, crude oil, machinery, gems, fertilizer, and chemicals. Between 2001 and 2011, the contribution of petrochemical and engineering goods to total exports grew from 14% to 42%. In 
India was the world's second largest textile exporter after China in the 2013 calendar year. Averaging an economic growth rate of 7.5% for several years prior to 2007, India has more than doubled its hourly wage rates during the first decade of the 21st century. Some 431 million Indians have left poverty since 1985. India's middle classes are projected to number around 580 million by 2030. Though ranking 51st in global competitiveness, as of 2010, India ranks 17th in financial market sophistication, 24th in the banking sector, 44th in business sophistication, and 39th in innovation, ahead of several advanced economies. With seven of the world's top 15 information technology outsourcing companies based in India, as of 2009, the country is viewed as the second most favorable outsourcing destination after the United States. India was ranked 48th in the Global Innovation Index in 2020, it has increased its ranking considerably since 2015, where it was 81st. India's consumer market, the world's 11th largest, is expected to become 5th largest by 2030. Driven by growth, India's nominal GDP per capita increased steadily from 308 US dollars in 1991, when economic liberalization began, to 1380 US dollars in 2010, to an estimated 1730 US dollars in 2016. It is expected to grow to 2313 US dollars by 2022. However, it has remained lower than those of other Asian developing countries such as Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Sri Lanka, and Thailand, and is expected to remain so in the near future. According to a 2011 PricewaterhouseCoopers report, India's GDP at purchasing power parity could overtake that of the United States by 2045. During the next four decades, Indian GDP is expected to grow at an annualized average of 8%, making it potentially the world's fastest-growing major economy until 2050. The report highlights key growth factors, a young and rapidly growing working-age population, growth in the manufacturing sector because of rising education and engineering skill levels, and sustained growth of the consumer market driven by a rapidly growing middle class. The World Bank cautions that, for India to achieve its economic potential, it must continue to focus on public sector reform, transport infrastructure, agricultural and rural development, removal of labor regulations, education, energy security, and public health and nutrition. According to the Worldwide Cost of Living Report 2017 released by the Economist Intelligence Unit which was created by comparing more than 400 individual prices across 160 products and services. Four of the cheapest cities were in India, Bangalore, Mumbai, Chennai and New Delhi. Chapter 7 Section 1, Industries India's telecommunication industry, is the second largest in the world with over 1.2 billion subscribers. It contributes 6.5% to India's GDP. After the third quarter of 2017, India surpassed the US to become the second largest smartphone market in the world after China. The Indian automotive industry, the world's second fastest growing, increased domestic sales by 26% during 2009-2010, and exports by 36% during 2008-2009. At the end of 2011, the Indian IT industry employed 2.8 million professionals, generated revenues close to 100 billion US dollars equaling 7.5% of Indian GDP, and contributed 26% of India's merchandise exports. The pharmaceutical industry in India emerged as a global player. As of 2021, with 3,000 pharmaceutical companies and 10,500 manufacturing units, India is the world's third largest pharmaceutical producer, largest producer of generic medicines and supply up to 50% minus 60% of global vaccines demand. These all contribute up to 24 US dollar and 44 cent billions in exports and India's local pharmaceutical market is estimated up to 42 billion US dollars. India is among the top 12 biotech destinations in the world. 
The Indian biotech industry grew by 15.1% in 2012 to 2013, increasing its revenues from 204.4 billion rupees to 235.24 billion rupees. Chapter 7 Section 2 Energy India's capacity to generate electrical power is 300 gigawatts, of which 42 gigawatts is renewable. The country's usage of coal is a major cause of greenhouse gas emissions by India but its renewable energy is competing strongly. India emits about 7% of global greenhouse gas emissions. This equates to about 2.5 tons of carbon dioxide per person per year, which is half the world average. Increasing access to electricity and clean cooking with liquefied petroleum gas have been priorities for energy in India. Chapter 7 Section 3 Socio-Economic Challenges Despite economic growth during recent decades, India continues to face socio-economic challenges. In 2006, India contained the largest number of people living below the World Bank's international poverty line of 1 US dollar and 25 cents per day. The proportion decreased from 60% in 1981 to 42% in 2005. Under the World Bank's later revised poverty line, it was 21% in 2011. 30.7% of India's children under the age of 5 are underweight. According to a Food and Agriculture Organization report in 2015, 15% of the population is undernourished. The midday meal scheme attempts to lower these rates. According to a 2016 Walk Free Foundation report, there were an estimated 18.3 million people in India, or 1.4% of the population, living in the forms of modern slavery, such as bonded labor, child labor, human trafficking, and forced begging, among others. According to the 2011 census, there were 10.1 million child laborers in the country, a decline of 2.6 million from 12.6 million in 2000, and 1. Since 1991, economic inequality between India's states has consistently grown, the per capita net state domestic product of the richest states in 2000, and 7 was 3.2 times that of the poorest. Corruption in India is perceived to have decreased. According to the Corruption Perceptions Index, India ranked 78th out of 180 countries in 2018 with a score of 41 out of 100, an improvement from 85th in 2014. Chapter 8 Demographics, Languages, and Religion With 1,210,193,422 residents reported in the 2011 Provisional Census Report, India is the world's second most populous country. Its population grew by 17.64% from 2001 to 2011, compared to 21.54% growth in the previous decade. The human sex ratio, according to the 2011 census, is 940 females per 1,000 males. The median age was 28.7 as of 2020. The first post-colonial census, conducted in 1951, counted 361 million people. Medical advances made in the last 50 years as well as increased agricultural productivity brought about by the Green Revolution have caused India's population to grow rapidly. The average life expectancy in India is at 68 years, 69.6 years for women, 67.3 years for men. There are around 50 physicians per 100,000 Indians. Migration from rural to urban areas has been an important dynamic in India's recent history. The number of people living in urban areas grew by 31.2% between 1991 and 2001. Yet, in 2001, over 70% still lived in rural areas. The level of urbanization increased further from 27.81% in the 2001 census to 31.16% in the 2011 census. The slowing down of the overall population growth rate was due to the sharp decline in the growth rate in rural areas, since 1991. According to the 2011 census, there are 53 million-plus urban agglomerations in India, among them Mumbai, Delhi, Kolkata, Chennai, Bangalore, Hyderabad, and Ahmedabad, 
in decreasing order by population. The literacy rate in 2011 was 74.04%, 65.46% among females and 82.14% among males. The rural urban literacy gap, which was 21.2 percentage points in 2001, dropped to 16.1 percentage points in 2011. The improvement in the rural literacy rate is twice that of urban areas. Kerala is the most literate state with 93.91% literacy, while Bihar the least with 63.82%. India is home to two major language families, Indo-Aryan and Dravidian. Other languages spoken in India come from the Austroasiatic and Sino-Tibetan language families. India has no national language. Hindi, with the largest number of speakers, is the official language of the government. English is used extensively in business and administration and has the status of a subsidiary official language, it is important in education, especially as a medium of higher education. Each state and union territory has one or more official languages, and the constitution recognizes in particular 22 scheduled languages. The 2011 census reported the religion in India with the largest number of followers was Hinduism, followed by Islam, the remaining were Christianity, Sikhism, Buddhism, Jainism and others. India has the third largest Muslim population, the largest for a non-Muslim majority country. Chapter 9, Culture Indian cultural history spans more than 4,500 years. During the Vedic period, the foundations of Hindu philosophy, mythology, theology and literature were laid, and many beliefs and practices which still exist today, such as Dharma, Karma, Yoga, and Moksha, were established. India is notable for its religious diversity, with Hinduism, Buddhism, Sikhism, Islam, Christianity, and Jainism among the nation's major religions. The predominant religion, Hinduism, has been shaped by various historical schools of thought, including those of the Upanishads, the Yoga Sutras, the Bhakti movement, and by Buddhist philosophy. Chapter 9 Section 1, Visual Art South Asia has an ancient tradition of art, which has exchanged influences with the parts of Eurasia. Seals from the 3rd millennium BCE in this valley civilization of Pakistan and northern India have been found, usually carved with animals, but a few with human figures. The Pashapati seal, excavated in Mohenjo-daro, Pakistan, in 1928-29, is the best known. After this there is a long period with virtually nothing surviving. Almost all surviving ancient Indian art thereafter is in various forms of religious, sculpture in durable materials, or coins. There was probably originally far more in wood, which is lost. In North India Mauryan art is the first imperial movement. In the first millennium CE, Buddhist art spread with Indian religions to Central, East and Southeast Asia, the last also greatly influenced by Hindu art. Over the following centuries a distinctly Indian style of sculpting the human figure developed, with less interest in articulating precise anatomy than ancient Greek sculpture but showing smoothly flowing forms expressing prana. This is often complicated by the need to give figures multiple arms or heads, or represent different genders on the left and right of figures, as with the Dhanarishvara form of Shiva and Parvati. Most of the earliest large sculpture is Buddhist, either excavated from Buddhist stupas such as Sanchi, Sarnath, and Amaravati, or is rock cut reliefs at sites such as Ajanta, Kala, and Ellora. Hindu and Jain sites appear rather later. In spite of this complex mixture of religious traditions, generally, the prevailing artistic style at any time and place has been shared by the major religious groups, and sculptors probably usually served all communities. Gupta art, at its peak circa 300 c circa 500 c is often regarded as a classical period whose influence lingered for many centuries after, it saw a new dominance of Hindu sculpture, as at the Elephanta Caves. Across the north, this became rather stiff and formulaic after circa 800 CE, though rich with finely carved detail in the surrounds of statues. But in the south, under the Pallava and Kola dynasties, 
sculpture in both stone and bronze had a sustained period of great achievement, the large bronzes with Shiva's Nataraja have become an iconic symbol of India. Ancient painting has only survived at a few sites, of which the crowded scenes of court life in the Ajanta caves are by far the most important, but it was evidently highly developed, and is mentioned as a courtly accomplishment in Gupta times. Painted manuscripts of religious texts survive from eastern India about the 10th century onwards, most of the earliest being Buddhist and later Jain. No doubt the style of these was used in larger paintings. The Persian-derived Deccan painting, starting just before the Mughal miniature, between them give the first large body of secular painting, with an emphasis on portraits, and the recording of princely pleasures and wars. The style spread to Hindu courts, especially among the Rajputs, and developed a variety of styles, with the smaller courts often the most innovative, with figures such as Nihal Chand and Nain Souk. As a market developed among European residents, it was supplied by company painting by Indian artists with considerable Western influence. In the 19th century, cheap Kaligat paintings of gods and everyday life, done on paper, were urban folk art from Calcutta, which later saw the Bengal School of Art, reflecting the art colleges founded by the British, the first movement in modern Indian painting. Chapter 9 Section 2 – Architecture Much of Indian architecture, including the Taj Mahal, other works of Mughal architecture, and South Indian architecture, blends ancient local traditions with imported styles. Vernacular architecture is also regional in its flavors. Vastu Shastra, literally science of construction or architecture and ascribed to Momuni Mayan, explores how the laws of nature affect human dwellings, it employs precise geometry and directional alignments to reflect perceived cosmic constructs. As applied in Hindu temple architecture, it is influenced by the Shilpa Shastras, a series of foundational texts whose basic mythological form is the Vastu Purusha Mandala, a square that embodied the Absolute. The Taj Mahal, built in Agra between 1631 and 1648 by orders of Emperor Shah Jahan in memory of his wife, has been described in the UNESCO World Heritage List as the jewel of Muslim art in India, and one of the universally admired masterpieces of the world's heritage. Indo-Saracenic Revival Architecture, developed by the British in the late 19th century, drew on Indo-Islamic architecture. Chapter 9 Section 3, Literature The earliest literature in India, composed between 1500 BC and 1200 CE, was in the Sanskrit language. Major works of Sanskrit literature include the Rigveda, the Epics, Mahabharata, and the Ramayana, Abhijanana Sakuntalam and Mahakavya poetry. In Tamil literature, the Sangam literature consisting of 2,381 poems, composed by 473 poets, is the earliest work. From the 14th to the 18th centuries, India's literary traditions went through a period of drastic change because of the emergence of devotional poets like Kabir, Tulsidas, and Guru Nanak. This period was characterized by a varied and wide spectrum of thought and expression, as a consequence, medieval Indian literary works differed significantly from classical traditions. In the 19th century, Indian writers took a new interest in social questions and psychological descriptions. In the 20th century, Indian literature was influenced by the works of the Bengali poet, author and philosopher Rabindranath Tagore, who was a recipient of the Nobel Prize in Literature. Chapter 9 Section 4, Performing Arts and Media Indian music ranges over various traditions and regional styles. Classical music encompasses two genres and their various folk offshoots, the northern Hindustani and southern Carnatic schools. Regionalized popular forms include filmy and folk music, the syncretic tradition of the balls is a well-known form of the latter. Indian dance also features diverse folk and classical forms. Among the better-known folk dances are, the Bangra of Punjab, the Bihu of Assam, the Chuma and Chow of Jharkhand, Odisha, and West Bengal, Garba and Danji of Gujarat, Vumar of Rajasthan, and the Lavani of Maharashtra. Eight dance forms, many with narrative forms and mythological elements, 
have been accorded classical dance status by India's National Academy of Music, Dance, and Drama. These are, Bharatnatyam of the state of Tamil Nadu, Kataka Uttar Pradesh, Katakali and Mohiniyattam of Kerala, Kuchipudi of Andhra Pradesh, Manipuri of Manipur, Odissi of Odisha, and the Satriya Assam. Theatre in India melds music, dance, and improvised or written dialogue. Often based on Hindu mythology, but also borrowing from medieval romances or social and political events, Indian theatre includes the Bavai of Gujarat, the Jotra of West Bengal, the Nautanki and Ramlila of North India, Tamasha of Maharashtra, Borakatha of Andhra Pradesh and Telangana, Turkatu of Tamil Nadu, and the Yakshagana of Karnataka. India has a theatre training institute the National School of Drama that is situated at New Delhi it is an autonomous organisation under the Ministry of Culture, Government of India. The Indian film industry produces the world's most watched cinema. Established regional cinematic traditions exist in the Assamese, Bengali, Bhojpuri, Hindi, Kannada, Malayalam, Punjabi, Gujarati, Marathi, Adiya, Tamil, and Telugu languages. The Hindi language film industry is the largest sector representing 43% of box office revenue, followed by the South Indian Telugu and Tamil film industries which represent 36% combined. Television broadcasting began in India in 1959 as a state-run medium of communication and expanded slowly for more than two decades. The state monopoly on television broadcast ended in the 1990s. Since then, satellite channels have increasingly shaped the popular culture of Indian society. Today, television is the most penetrative media in India, industry estimates indicate that as of 2012 there are over 554 million TV consumers, 462 million with satellite or cable connections compared to other forms of mass media such as the press, radio or internet. Chapter 9 Section 5 Society Traditional Indian society is sometimes defined by social hierarchy. The Indian caste system embodies much of the social stratification and many of the social restrictions found on the Indian subcontinent. Social classes are defined by thousands of endogamous hereditary groups, often termed as jatis, or castes. India declared untouchability to be illegal in 1947, and has since enacted other anti-discriminatory laws and social welfare initiatives. Family values are important in the Indian tradition, and multi-generational patrilineal joint families have been the norm in India, though nuclear families are becoming common in urban areas. An overwhelming majority of Indians, with their consent, have their marriages arranged by their parents or other family elders. Marriage is thought to be for life, and the divorce rate is extremely low, with less than one in a thousand marriages ending in divorce. Child marriages are common, especially in rural areas, many women wed before reaching 18, which is their legal marriageable age. Female infanticide in India, and lately female feticide, have created skewed gender ratios, the number of missing women in the country quadrupled from 15 million to 63 million in the 50-year period ending in 2014, faster than the population growth during the same period, and constituting 20% of India's female electorate. Accord to an Indian government study, an additional 21 million girls are unwanted and do not receive adequate care. Despite a government ban on sex-selective feticide, the practice remains commonplace in India, the result of a preference for boys in a patriarchal society. The payment of dowry, although illegal, remains widespread across class lines. Deaths resulting from dowry, mostly from bride burning, are on the rise, despite stringent anti-dowry laws. Many Indian festivals are religious in origin. The best known include, Diwali, Ganesh Chaturthi, Tai Pongal, Holi, Durga Puja, Eid ul Fitir, Bakr Eid, Christmas, and Vaisakhi. Chapter 9 Section 6, Education In the 2011 census, about 73% of the population was literate, with 81% for men and 65% for women. This compares to 1981 when the respective rates were 41%, 53% and 29%. 
In 1951 the rates were 18%, 27% and 9%. In 1921 the rates 7%, 12% and 2%. In 1891 they were 5%, 9% and 1%, according to Latika Chaudhry, in 1911 there were under 3 primary schools for every 10 villages. Statistically, more caste and religious diversity reduced private spending. Primary schools taught literacy, so local diversity limited its growth. The education system of India is the world's second largest. India has over 900 universities, 40,000 colleges, and 1.5 million schools. In India's higher education system, a significant number of seats are reserved under affirmative action policies for the historically disadvantaged. In recent decades India's improved education system is often cited as one of the main contributors to its economic development. Chapter 9 Section 7 – Clothing From ancient times until the advent of the modern, the most widely worn traditional dress in India was draped. For women it took the form of a sari, a single piece of cloth many yards long. The sari was traditionally wrapped around the lower body and the shoulder. In its modern form, it is combined with an underskirt, or Indian petticoat, and tucked in the waistband for more secure fastening. It is also commonly worn with an Indian blouse, or choli, which serves as the primary upper body garment, the sari's end, passing over the shoulder, serving to cover the midriff and obscure the upper body's contours. For men, a similar but shorter length of cloth, the dhoti, has served as a lower body garment. The use of stitched clothes became widespread after Muslim rule was established at first by the Delhi Sultanate and then continued by the Mughal Empire. Among the garments introduced during this time and still commonly worn are, the shalwas and pajamas, both styles of trousers, and the tunics kotar and kameez. In southern India, the traditional draped garments were to see much longer continuous use. Shalwas are atypically wide at the waist but narrow to a cuffed bottom. They are held up by a drawstring, which causes them to become pleated around the waist. The pants can be wide and baggy, or they can be cut quite narrow, on the bias, in which case they are called chiradars. When they are ordinarily wide at the waist and their bottoms are hemmed but not cuffed, they are called pajamas. The kameez is a long shirt or tunic, its side seams left open below the waistline. The kota is traditionally collarless and made of cotton or silk, it is worn plain or with embroidered decoration, such as shikan, and typically falls to either just above or just below the wearer's knees. In the last 50 years, fashions have changed a great deal in India. Increasingly, in urban northern India, the sari is no longer the apparel of everyday wear, though they remain popular on formal occasions. The traditional shalwar kameez is rarely worn by younger urban women, who favor chiradars or jeans. In white-collar office settings, ubiquitous air conditioning allows men to wear sports jackets year-round. For weddings and formal occasions, men in the middle and upper classes often wear band gala, or short narrow jackets, with pants, with the groom and his groomsmen sporting sherwanis and chiradars. The dhoti, once the universal garment of Hindu males, the wearing of which in the homespun and handwoven khadi allowed Gandhi to bring Indian nationalism to the millions, is seldom seen in the cities. Chapter 9 Section 8 Cuisine The foundation of a typical Indian meal is a cereal cooked in a plain fashion and complemented with flavorful savory dishes. The cooked cereal could be steamed rice, chapati, a thin unleavened bread made from wheat flour, or occasionally cornmeal, and griddle cooked dry, the idli, a steamed breakfast cake, or dosa, a griddled pancake, both leavened and made from a batter of rice and gram meal. The savory dishes might include lentils, pulses and vegetables commonly spiced with ginger and garlic, but also with a combination of spices that may include coriander, cumin, turmeric, cinnamon, cardamom and others as informed by culinary conventions. They might also include poultry, fish or meat dishes. In some instances, the ingredients might be mixed during the process of cooking. A platter, or tali, 
used for eating usually has a central place reserved for the cooked cereal, and peripheral ones for the flavorful accompaniments, which are often served in small bowls. The cereal and its accompaniments are eaten simultaneously rather than a piecemeal manner. This is accomplished by mixing, for example of rice and lentils, or folding, wrapping, scooping or dipping, such as chapati and cooked vegetables or lentils. India has distinctive vegetarian cuisines, each a feature of the geographical and cultural histories of its adherents. The appearance of ahimsa, or the avoidance of violence toward all forms of life in many religious orders early in Indian history, especially Upanishadic Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism, is thought to have contributed to the predominance of vegetarianism among a large segment of India's Hindu population, especially in southern India, Gujarat, the Hindi-speaking belt of north-central India, as well as among Jains. Although meat is eaten widely in India, the proportional consumption of meat in the overall diet is low. Unlike China, which has increased its per capita meat consumption substantially in its years of increased economic growth, in India the strong dietary traditions have contributed to dairy, rather than meat, becoming the preferred form of animal protein consumption. The most significant import of cooking techniques into India during the last millennium occurred during the Mughal Empire. Dishes such as the pilaf, developed in the Abbasid Caliphate, and cooking techniques such as the marinating of meat in yogurt, spread into northern India from regions to its northwest. To the simple yogurt marinade of Persia, onions, garlic, almonds and spices began to be added in India. Rice was partially cooked and layered alternately with the sautéed meat, the pot sealed tightly, and slow cooked according to another Persian cooking technique, to produce what has today become the Indian biryani, a feature of festive dining in many parts of India. In the food served in Indian restaurants worldwide the diversity of Indian food has been partially concealed by the dominance of Punjabi cuisine. The popularity of tandoori chicken, cooked in the tandoor oven, which had traditionally been used for baking bread in the rural Punjab and the Delhi region, especially among Muslims, but which is originally from Central Asia, dates to the 1950s, and was caused in large part by an entrepreneurial response among people from the Punjab, who had been displaced by the 1947 partition of India. Chapter 9 Section 9 Sports and Recreation Several traditional indigenous sports such as Kabaddi, Koko, Pilwani and Jili Dunda, and also martial arts, such as Kalaripayatu and Mama Adi remain popular. Chess is commonly held to have originated in India as Chaturanga, there has been a rise in the number of Indian grandmasters. Viswanathan Anand became the undisputed chess world champion in 2007 and held the status until 2013. Pachisi is derived from Pachisi another traditional Indian pastime, which in early modern times was played on a giant marble court by Mughal Emperor Akbar the Great. Cricket is the most popular sport in India. Major domestic competitions include the Indian Premier League, which is the most watched cricket league in the world and ranks sixth among all sports leagues. Other professional leagues include the Pro Football and the Pro Kabaddi Leagues. India has won two ODI Cricket World Cups, the 1983 edition and the 2011 edition and has eight field hockey gold medals in the Summer Olympics. The improved results garnered by the Indian Davis Cup team and other Indian tennis players in the early 2010s have made tennis increasingly popular in the country. India has a comparatively strong presence in shooting sports, and has won several medals at the Olympics, the World Shooting Championships, and the Commonwealth Games. Other sports in which Indians have succeeded internationally include badminton, boxing, and wrestling. Football is popular in West Bengal, Goa, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, and the northeastern states. India has hosted or co-hosted several international sporting events, the 1951 and 1982 Asian Games, the 1987, 1996, and 2011 Cricket World Cup tournaments, the 2003 Afro-Asian Games, the 2006 ICC Champions Trophy, the 2009 World Badminton Championships, the 2010 Hockey World Cup, the 2010 Commonwealth Games, 
and the 2017 FIFA U-17 World Cup. Major international sporting events held annually in India include the Maharashtra Open, the Mumbai Marathon, the Delhi Half Marathon, and the Indian Masters. The first Formula One Indian Grand Prix featured in late 2011, but has been discontinued from the F1 season calendar since 2014. India has traditionally been the dominant country at the South Asian Games. An example of this dominance is the basketball competition where the Indian team won three out of four tournaments to date.